Our next speaker uh, is the leader of this great land-grant university that we're sitting on today. Uh, I'm, it's my alma mater, so I can call it great. Um, and we really appreciate uh, his time today, too. He has a very distinguished resume. He's been in production agriculture himself, along with his academic pursuits, and was previously the dean of SDSU's College of Ag and Biosciences before assuming the presidency of South Dakota State University in 2016. He's been on the leading edge of building our next generation of producers and researchers, so please help me welcome uh, SDSU President Dr. Barry Dunn. Well, thank you, Chris, and good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you. What a great crowd. Uh, very excited to see uh, young people from, I think, high school classes and, and Lake Area Tech and Mitchell Tech and, and our own students here at SDSU. So thanks for, uh, for you being here especially. Um, it, as, as Chris said, it is a great university and I'm very proud of my alma mater too. So uh, I find myself in a, a great, uh, great position, humbly, humbled to be there and uh, very excited to be with you, with you this morning. It's a beautiful morning in South Dakota. I, uh, that sunrise this morning, I think we all want a lot more of those. I'm not sure we will, but uh, we've, it's been a kind of a gray and dreary time. And so I, I think the, the sunrise this morning was befitting of this conference. It's just a perfect metaphor for the future, uh, that bright sunny morning that, that, that we had. Well, I'm gonna take a, a little bit different approach than the governor and uh, I look forward to uh, trying to provoke you and stimulate your thoughts on, on ideas and, and really uh, talk about some of the, the challenges that livestock development has, but also arm you with some, some uh, kind of unusual approach to looking at how beneficial it is to society in general and how important it is. So the agenda that I have is to uh, set the stage for, for what I'm gonna talk about. And then uh, I'm gonna stress the importance of unbiased scientific information as the foundation for, for livestock development. We're gonna talk about our food system that we have. I'm gonna uh, discuss a little bit about SDSU and, and how we're going to play a future in ag development. And then um, talk a little bit about the persistent challenges and some of the unintended consequences of, of, uh, of agriculture. Uh, and then uh, end with some uh, thoughts about the enormous potential that it has for all of us in South Dakota. So as Governor Dugard, Governor Dugard and I were born in the same year, and so we share that. And as Governor Dugard said, agriculture in, in the 1950s was very, very different than it, than it is today. That's a combine from the early 1950s and uh, looks pretty rudimentary compared to what most of you think of as a combine today. Uh, agriculture in the 1950s, when Governor Dugard and I were, were youngsters, uh, was very labor intensive, um, small in comparison, um, in terms of, of, almost, of levels of production, of impact, of scale, just a very different um, system than we have today. In 1950, in the year 1950, 12.2% of the labor force in America uh, uh, worked on farms. And that, that's not family farmers. That's, that, that would just be counting uh, farm workers and, and the, probably the male uh, of the family who was working on farms. And that labor force didn't include, didn't credit any, uh, um, as I could dug into this, any credit to the family that did support uh, family agriculture in South Dakota. So my parents and Governor Dugard's parents in the 1950s spent 30% um, of their disposable income on food, 30%. So remember that, remember 12.2%, remember 30%. And there were 5 million, 300 and whatever, 80,000 farms in, in, in the United States. And again, very rudimentary, very basic, uh, lots of labor, large families. Um, I think um, many, many farm stories from my generation were that when the last son or daughter left home for college or the, the, to serve in our, our nation's military, whatever that next step in life was, when that last young person left the farm, uh, mom and dad sold the livestock because livestock were very intensive 
uh, those production systems back then were very, very labor intensive. Shoveling manure, shoveling feed, um, hand carrying everything, um, and, and yet very uh, small in comparison to what we think of today. <clears throat> but the post-World War II boom in agricultural, in the agricultural revolution that I've seen in my life was, was fundamentally and irrefutably based on this spread of unbiased, scientific-based information. And so the nutrition, the genetics that the governor talked about, all of that has its roots at land-grant universities like SDSU and the Agricultural Research Service of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. An enormous investment post-World War II in, in, in the research of how to improve food production, food safety, food quality, um, uh, food, uh, nutri the nutrition of food, and all sorts of production. Uh, uh, so so that, that part of it, but also on the production side, just revolutionizing um, uh, uh, agricultural production. So the large barns that, I, that were pictured in, the, in the, uh, that earlier slide that I had, uh, the ag engineering that went into that uh, is just assumed today. And it was cutting edge in the 1950s and the 1960s delivering water, air quality, managing uh, that environment inside those barns had never been done in the history of the world. And again, it, we assume that it's, that, that that's just, we're gonna go build a swine barn and, um, and that's not the way it was. It took a lot of experimentation, unbiased uh, results, and now engineering firms all over the Midwest, all over South Dakota use uh, not even knowing, but use that, the, the uh, ventilation sh systems that were designed, the watering systems, et cetera, that were designed with <clears throat> that unbiased scientific-based information. But it impacted herd health, uh, just dramatic differences in, in uh, mortal morbidity and mortality, uh, dramatic differences in fertility uh, and in um, reproductive efficiency uh, of, uh, of number of weaned pigs and, and I think thought the governor did a great job of painting this picture of this incredible increase in productivity. And, uh, but I want you to know that it was based on an, uh, an investment uh, by South Dakota, by the U.S. Uh, uh, Department of Agriculture through the land grant system in USDA uh, in agricultural research. And that knowledge uh, was um, transferred to the classroom for me when I was here as a freshman in 1971 and it was transferred in laboratories uh, that, that we used and uh, part of the big picture or part of my story today is that that uh, those classrooms and laboratories um, from long ago uh, when I was here have all been rebuilt and refreshed and new and uh, and I'll sh show you some pictures of those but one thing about um, agricultural educate or education about agriculture is that that it doesn't fit well with um, uh, web-based learning. It, it certainly parts of it can, but experiential learning is critically important, especially today because many young people don't grow up handling livestock. Many people, young people, have never been inside a swine barn. Uh, very few people actually have ever been inside a swine barn and know what it takes to, uh, to do those jobs. And so the education that we've developed, the, the pedagogy it's called that Dr. Mystery has developed and in, in dairy science and Dr. Cassidy, our department head in animal science and, and uh, Dr. Van Kelly, our department head of ag and biosystems engineering, it's all based on experiential learning, uh, not just uh, you know, a book or a, a DVD. Well, the, the next part of that <clears throat> was uh, that, that story of how uh, th this revolution of agriculture uh, took place was through the dissemination and diffusion of ideas through the Extension Service and, and through um, industry partnerships. And um, that, so that unbiased science-based information flowed into society uh, through a robust extension system and, uh, and industry partnerships. And it, it still does today. 
but I, I, I don't think we should take any of that uh, hard work by many great people for granted. Think about that combine that you saw in the earlier picture. Think about your vision of agriculture today and give some credit to an, uh, some tremendous people who had the, had the, the skills and the, the passion to trans, trans, uh, for, transfer to us complex uh, ideas and thoughts and systems into a lay language that we could adopt into, into production systems. <clears throat> so the result of that revolution that I just described is the most productive, safe, efficient food system in the history of the world. It's extremely diverse, and in South, <clears throat> and in South Dakota, you'll have an organic farm that is actually, you know, per acre is incredibly productive, all the way to those uh, poultry barns on, on the other side of the screen, which are unbelievably efficient and productive in producing taking coarse grains, as, as Governor Dugard said, and creating some of the finest protein uh, in, in, the, in, in the world. It's also unimaginably productive, as, as Governor Dugard said. And I'll, I'll, I'll use some different statistics and different way of looking at it. So the production system that my grandfather had on a West River ranch down in Todd County on the Rosebud Reservation had to sell yearlings because the weaning weights were so small that, that the cattle were uh, not fit for anything other than to be grown and backgrounded. And, and, the, and the weaning weights of today that, that, that many people uh, have across the state are the, are the yearling weights of the 1950s. Cattle production uh, is, is just incredible. Um, there, I, when I was ranching in, uh, in the 70s and 80s and 90s, but at that critical point in the early 80s during the farm crisis, there were still three-year-old steers being sold in the Valentine and Winter sale barns of, south, uh, of, west, of, of west, the western parts of Nebraska and South Dakota. And now um, those same weight of cattle are, are being slaughtered within, at, at a year of age, not three years of age, before they even went on feed. Just an enormous difference in, in productivity, let alone the health and mortality uh, or morbidity mortality levels uh, back then were just, would just seem um, totally unacceptable to what uh, is achieved today. That cornfield in the middle, um, literally in my lifetime, went from 40 to 50 bushels an acre to 250 bushels an acre. Um, you know, I, I, I know, I knew, he's passed away, a farmer who was still using open pollinated corn in the 1980s. And, and so the productivity of a cornfield um, from 50 to 250 uh, and, and the difference in, the, in, in what it takes to grow that 250 bushel corn, the genetics behind it and the, the agronomy behind it are just, uh, just um, really almost miraculous. And the, swine, the picture of that swine unit, and you'll hear there are many better ex experts on swine than I am, but... Um, uh, weaned pigs per sow per year over 30 is, would, would just uh, blow my uncle, who had a farm in Iowa and raised pigs, uh, if Ro my uncle Roger was still alive, would just blow him. He just wouldn't believe it uh, as he struggled to, to wean, you know, a, um, a dozen pigs um, out of two litters uh, because of health and mortality problems. One way to look at it is, is this slide, the, the top graph. This is corn, and that's a yield. It's not a curve, it's a line, uh, just about as straight as, uh, just a, a nice trajectory. Um, the top line is our crop performance trials across South Dakota. We do those every year, and uh, that's about a 40-year period of time. And the bottom line is, is uh, USDA Ag Statistics Service, and the slopes are a little bit different. But that... The, the, the fundamental reason why this summit is so important is that slide. Because we're going to build two to four bushels an acre into our crop production systems uh, year after year after year. And the fact that those slides are different and that is, is actually the yield potential that is waiting to be captured with improved precision agriculture. And, and you will capture it. Farmers will be able to capture it. Uh, as time moves on. 
But by the same token, that yield potential will t continue to increase. Um, and, and that's the story of why livestock development uh, is so important. Because we will be crushed by supply if we don't find a way to add uh, value. Certainly ethanol is part of it, but we need to eat those distiller's grains. We need to uh, consume coarse grains like soybeans and, and corn. And livestock development is the way to do it. So <clears throat> agriculture in 2018, 1.3% of the nation's labor force and consumers spending less than 10% of their disposable income on food. And it's better food. It's safer, it's more nutritious, and it's more reliable, there's more of it. And a carbon footprint on swine production, 35% lower per pound of, of, of carcass. And that's true, um, UC Davis um, out in California has done a a lot of work, great work, on the carbon footprint of agriculture. And that figure, that 35%, uh, I could have shown you 20, uh, 20 different uh, uh, analysis of crops, and that number is, is consistent. So the carbon footprint per unit of food produced is dramatically lower than it was 50 years ago or 60 years ago. And so consumers may or may not know that, but the efficiencies built into the system are, are just, um, in, uh, are, the payoff is something like a smaller carbon footprint. And, and so how do you do that? Well, well I, I, I look out and see Roxanne, and I had her in class, and because maintenance energy, Roxanne, is just eroded away because of the time from, from conception to consumption, if that makes sense. And I know you're gonna nod, and, and you're the PhD nu nutritionist, and you know it. That's right, isn't it? Maintenance energy in the production system, just maintaining the cow, maintaining the sow, uh, the ewe, the, the, chick, the chicken, is so much lower than it used to be that our carbon footprint of the system can be so much lower. And we have 62% fewer farms, good, bad, or whatever. That, that's, um, that's a reality. So as a result of, of that switch in agriculture, Human creativity and, and human potential has been unleashed. If you do the math on the percentage of people who were working on farms in the 1950s, and if that same number of people needed to work on farms in 2018, this is rough but because the, the statistics are a little bit rough, but about 50 million people in America would have to move back to the farms to do the work of the 1950s system. 50 million people aren't in agriculture. They're developing cell phones, they're developing medical technology, they're developing uh, autonomous vehicles. That human potential has increased the standard of living of all of us because we, we unleashed it from shoveling manure out of a sow barn or shoveling feed into a, into a, uh, a feed bunk. And, and, and those people who were doing those jobs, most of them young, are now the creative genius behind the things that you see on that slide. And it's improved the quality of life and increased longevity. So what do you do when you take 30% of disposable income down to less than 10%. That 20 plus percent out of every dollar is available for improved quality of life, for recreation, earlier retirement, um, going to the Twins game. That's a lot of money. 20 cents, 20 probably more than that, but 20 cents out of every dollar is now available to do other things than to spend it on food. And the food that we do buy is safer and more nutritious and more reliable and healthier. And on the longevity side, my dad was born in 1921, I was born in 53, and my sons were born in the late 80s. My longevity is just, we'll see, uh, my dad passed away uh, a while back, but the predicted longevity of, for me versus my dad is 12 years. 
For a person born in 1921 to 53, it's my, the longevity is 12 years. And for my son, it's nearly 10 years longer than mine. That's what unleashing human potential and unleashing dollars uh, out of, uh, from food to other things does for a society. And I don't think society appreciates it, and I don't think they even come close to understanding it. Where that, that 20 cents came from, where that creative genius came from, but of course, challenges have emerged, and they're serious, and they're, they're important, and they're dealt with by in county, at county meetings and, and state policy meetings, and, um, uh, and they need to be talked about. Because odor, livestock manure, animal husbandry, all are issues for American consumers and, um, and, and our neighbors and whether they be in, within our neighborhood or within uh, the neighborhood of, uh, of our entire state. I don't get it because that's the happiest cow I've ever seen. And, uh, and in a large dairy, the, uh, the quality of life of a cow uh, is, is actually very, right Vikram? I saw Vikram out there, Vikram's there. Um, is actually very nice. The stress, if you measure stress hormones levels of that cow, it doesn't get much better than that. Um, and if you ma measure stress hormones versus that compared to the dairy herd that, that Governor Dugard's um, uh, parents took care of, 12, 10 or 12 cows standing outside on a shivering, uh, in, probably in standing in manure or in, in wasted feed is just totally different. I think we, we, uh, we lost, uh, maybe won some wars, but lost some battles when, when as I, was, I went to school kind of at a tipping point time when, when uh, an, the, the, the field of animal science um, was relatively new. It had been switched from animal husbandry to animal science. And I'm not sure, Heidi, as I, uh, that that was a good thing. Uh, if we'd have stayed with animal husbandry, we might, might have get, re, uh, kept some consumer confidence. Um, so it's, uh, uh, I have every confidence in, the, in these modern systems, uh, but I know that everybody, not everybody does. And certainly there are unintended consequences in the raising of coarse grains. <clears throat> um, um, you know, when, when, when monarchs and, uh, and honeybees are, are not doing well, and those are important pollinators, let alone important insects, of all types in the modern system, and we have water quality issues, and I see Jay out there. Um, we, we have to think very carefully about uh, modern agriculture and its impact on the environment. And because not, there's certainly been some unintended con negative consequences to, to our practices, and we need to use science-based information uh, and techniques to, to get them, to address them. So <clears throat> how is SDSU helping to build the future for livestock development? And you can see a picture there of our new cow-calf unit that, um, and I'll show you some more pictures. Um, South Dakota State, with the help of um, many people in this room today, including East River, uh, have rebuilt the, the, life, the livestock facilities and the agricultural facilities on this campus. The two facilities that we have going, that, that's a picture inside our new swine unit, and. Uh, down our feed alley of our, our new um, <coughs> uh, high-tech uh, feed area for, for beef cattle. Uh, uh, the, the Animal Disease Research and Diagnostic Lab that the governor mentioned is, is now uh, up and being closed in for the winter to be finished. Uh, Precision Ag Building, the, 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 the reddish-colored building they see in that, that um, drawing will, will start in the spring. Since 2010, this university will have, with the help of everybody in this room, will have invested $170 million in rebuilding the College of Agriculture at this university. $170 million of new facilities for these young people to learn in, to, to grow, um, to, whose, whose research will impact their lives in ways none of us can, can begin to imagine. But we've done other things too. On the curriculum side, we have the only, we're the only land grant university in the United States with a degree in precision agriculture. Um, uh, the University of Minnesota has invited us to join them in a new two plus two rural veterinary medicine 
uh, school. So think about Governor Dugard's challenge of eating up more of those coarse feeds uh, and growing livestock production and the timing of that, of this step for uh, a, a two-year uh, veterinary program here at SDSU for a class of 20 and then as uh, juniors and seniors moving to the U of M for their clinicals uh, absolutely couldn't be better and we're very excited about it and would certainly appreciate your support as we move forward with this important project. But the daunting challenge that I'll leave you with <clears throat> is that we need to, to gain or regain public trust and understanding of agricultural systems. And so what we did uh, in, in, in our new swine facility, if you can see those young people looking through the window, we, we created a facility where county commissioners, state legislators, policymakers, consumers can see modern swine production and, uh, and, and demystify, that was the term we used, demystify it uh, so that you don't have to shower in and shower out to learn how a swine operation goes. I hope that we wear that place out. I hope we get so many people up and down that hallway that, it's, that we have to take appointments. Because when we do that, we will, uh, through that, the use of that type of, uh, we, we can rebuild trust in, our, in ag systems. We, we need to continue to invest in ag research and extension and extension budgets have been cut most recently by state government and, and that's the wrong way to go. We need to invest in the diffusion of information to society. That's what extension's done since 1914. There's no other model like it in the world. Nothing, nothing is successful. <clears throat> and as complex as ag agriculture is, we need to invest in it, not, not uh, reduce it. We need to tell our story we need to participate in industry, and many industry leaders are here today, and I thank you and congratulate you to, for your service to our industry, and we need to build coalitions among ag industries um, and ag industry groups to, to, uh, to accomplish that, uh, building trust and, and, and confidence in our system. Well, my, next to the last slide is that <clears throat> livestock production is really, uh, has been, and, and uh, always will be, kind of first and foremost in value-added agriculture. I get ethanol and I get how important it is, and, and I certainly uh, burn it in my car every day, but there's still distiller's grains to be used. And uh, so value-added agriculture through livestock production just makes sense to me. It's at the, it's at, at the core of who I am. I'll let we have some economists on the panel, but I just did, uh, Bob Toller helped me look at some basis differences between Minnesota and Iowa, and, and, it, and it varies, and, and I just, if I did a gross average over many years, it looks like about a quarter of a, uh, 25 cents per bushel of uh, uh, higher prices in southern Minnesota, western Minnesota, and western Iowa than South Dakota. And it's because they have more livestock and they, they've, they've taken the step, they have the infrastructure, they, they've got the diagnostic labs, they have veterinarians, they have the feed companies, all of that infrastructure to support it, the processing plants, and, and we can too. But we must use sound science, <clears throat> we must adhere to regulation, and when regulations and policies are outdated, we need leadership uh, to, to help adjust them and make them appropriate for the time. And as producers, we need to exhibit exemplary stewardship every day of, of our life. And through those processes, through that, that bulleted list, I believe we can regain uh, trust from our neighbors um, and our brothers and sisters and our community members uh, here in South Dakota. So my last slide is a picture of the Niobrara River that that I used to live north of, and, and, and so <clears throat> my, I, I think Heather, um, uh, is Heather Gessner is here, and Heather, I've shown this slide before, um, so, and I've asked the question, is this a sunrise or a sunset? Well, if you know the Niobrara River, it flows from east to west, from west to east, there you go, west to east across northern Nebraska. And if you look carefully, you can see ripples in the water, and you can figure out that that's a sunrise. 
And I think we need to approach this Livestock Summit and every day in agriculture as a sunrise. Opportunity is just waiting for these young people to improve their lives, their longevity, their health, their security, their food security, just as it did uh, from 1950 to, uh, to an old man here today. Thanks again for being here. You're a great audience. Uh, it's, it's your leadership that will make this happen. Thanks to East River um, Electric for sponsoring it. Uh, great example of leadership that we all appreciate. And uh, I've got, got lots of friends out there and uh, I wanna thank you for your support of, of uh, making agriculture uh, at SDSU relevant and, uh, and ready for these young people here in front of me. So thank you very much.